Okay, Master Gardeners, welcome back to part two. I apologize that this computer timed me out. Again, this is all brand new to me. This computer timed me out a little bit on uh, doing this slideshow, so I didn't get to say this. that was the end of part one, and this is the beginning of part two. Oh, well, guys, this is the beginning of part two. Pomegranates. Pomegranates are something you can grow in Florida. Most people don't realize that. Uh, they are quite successful. I have that particular bush that you're looking at right there, if you look real close, you can see all these little orange things on there. That's actually the flowers on there. Uh, if you've never seen a pomegranate flower, they are quite interesting. <clears throat> I don't know that they've gotten anything, but I've actually seen hummingbirds working on, on pomegranate flowers. They are the right color for them anyway. Okay. <clears throat> Pomegranates are an old world fruit. They originated in Southeast Europe and Asia. They were brought into the New World by Spanish missionaries. They are best grown in climates where there are cool winters and warm, dry summers. Well, wait a minute. Florida has cool, dry winters and hot, steamy, wet summers. It's not the best place in the world for them, but they do grow here. In Florida, pomegranates' main challenge are fungus, fungal problems in the summer. The leaves uh, and the fruit can be heavily blemished on the skins. It's not something that you're going to grow to have that beautiful red pomegranate that you see at your local neighborhood grocery store that looks perfect. You're not going to get that from a Florida pomegranate. In fact, I'm going to probably say this someplace else, um, you're probably not going to grow that red pomegranate in Florida. That particular one that you saw back there uh, before, uh, when it ripens, it's kind of a muddled red, orange, uh, green, gobbledygook, but the drooplets or the whatever they're called, I forgot now what the, the little pieces of fruit are actually called, they are bright uh, crimson red, so you still get the, the same fruit. Pomegranates uh, in Florida, da, 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 let's the next slide, okay. Um, pomegranate growth requirements. Plants grow best in a heavy loam soil, but are well adapted to conditions from beach sand to clay soils. pH ranges from 5.5 to 7, which is pretty much where most of our soil is in the state of Florida. We can be a little more acidic than that. So you want to check it out, but you, they're basically uh, right there in the middle of the pH range where you where you want them to be. Trees should be watered every seven to 10 days when there is when there has been no rain. But truthfully, pomegranates again grow best in that Mediterranean climate. So once they get well established, uh, I haven't watered mine in four or five years. Uh, fertilized pomegranates, um, uh, fertilized pomegranates in November and March, approximately four to six pounds per year uh, total. So you want to, if you're fertilizing twice, you want to fertilize uh, in November uh, with about two to th two to three pounds, and then again in March. That's contrary to what I've said before, also, and I would be a little fearful. Uh, of that November fertilization with cold, but the University of Florida says that's when you do it. Very interesting. If you over fertilize your pomegranates, though, um, it can lead to late fruit maturity, fruit drop, and poor fruit color. Pomegranates are one of those things that they don't want a whole lot of stimulation. They just want to kind of eke their way through through the growing season and take it from there. Pomegranates in the backyard can be successfully grown. Uh, make sure to identify the variety that you like before you start putting things in the ground. Remember that there are many varieties of pomegranates. Many do not have that deep dark red skin and the fruit can go from almost a white fruit to, to practically purple. Uh, I've got one in my yard that I would tell you not to grow, and that, that is the Vietnamese variety. And the reason I do not like the Vietnamese variety is because the little uh, fruits are almost 50% seed, uh, whereas you get that big red pomegranate uh, that you get in the, uh, again, the grocery store, it's probably closer to 60, 70% of that little fruitlet is uh, 
is uh, juice and probably 30% on the seed side. I do have two varieties right now that I'm trying to grow. They have not started fruiting yet that I'm seeing if I get any uh, better results from those. One is called Wonderful and the other is called Crimson Red, I believe. Okay, but pomegranates are relatively easy, uh, don't need a lot of attention. And uh, just, uh, I would tell you though, and I didn't write this down, I would spray them uh, with uh, neem oil a couple times during the summer just to try to hold that fungus down a little bit. They can be thorny, so again, you're not going to get that nice, uh, the branches can be thorny, so you can get some blemishes to the skin from wind, da wind damage. Next. Avocados. Those are two avocado trees that were growing near my house for many, many years. They were absolutely wonderful trees. Uh, they uh, produced avocados uh, from about um, 1st of July through to mid-August, mid mid, even maybe into parts of September. Um, we're going to talk about avocados in a minute, but let's talk first of all, talk about how you Trees need to be planted in areas with good drainage. Avocados will not tolerate wet, flooded soil. Good sized trees to plant are in about a three gallon pot. Again, smaller pot, not, not very big, and three to four feet in height. Root, uh, root bound trees, meaning again that that root growth out by the edge of the pot is all, the roots are all real heavily wrapped there. Uh, that tree probably will never grow very well. This is a different rule. Re University of Florida says remove all grasses three feet around the hole. Dig the hole three to four times the width of the pot. Use the soil that came out of the hole to replant. Fertilize young trees every two months. Make sure fertilizer has trace minerals to it. That again is iron, copper, manganese, magnesium, uh, uh, sulfur, you got to flip the bag over. That that's another lesson for you guys. Not this one today. Uh, mature trees um, should be fertilized in February, May, and September. Uh, those young trees about every two months. The one of the interesting thing about avocados is their flowers. Avocado flowers are different from most other fruit trees in that they, although they are perfect, meaning they have male and female uh, parts to the flower, they don't necessarily produce pollen and a receptive to pollen at the same time. For best production, it takes a flower, an avocado with a flower type of A and an avocado with a flower type of B. And why is that? The A type produces pollen in the morning, but is receptive to pollen in the afternoon. The B type is receptive to pollen in the morning and produces pollen in the afternoon. So you need to have both types there to get a real good set. That's not to say if you put down one avocado tree that you won't get some avocados on it, you will. But you need to, if you want a real good production, you need that both that A and B. For this reason, not. For this reason, not knowing the variety of the tree can lead to a very low fruit set. Any good nursery should be able to tell you what type of tree and what type of flower that tree has so that you know if it's got an A or B. If they can tell you, well, it is a um, Haas, and there is a Florida Haas avocado, uh, if it's a Haas, but they can't tell you if it's an A or B, I'd probably walk away and find that nursery that can tell me not only is it a Haas, but it is a, a B type flower and you need an A type to help pollinate it. Uh, if you, again, my phone, I've got to shut this phone off. I apologize. Paul, Paul Delegato wants to tell me it's lightning all over while I'm recording this. Anyway, uh, one variety that I'm high, high on is, if you can find it, is a Brogdon. That's another story, but just throw that out there for you. Tree growth from seed. They may produce fruit, but the flower type is un, unknown, and for that reason, it generally can cause a few problems. And that you can't say if it's an A or B, so you don't know what to plant next to it to get best production. Now, here we go with a little sad part.
ambrosia beetle. What is an ambrosia beetle? Ambrosia beetles were brought into the United States in, from Indonesia. Uh, the ambrosia beetle carries a fungus called laurel wilt. The beetle bores into the tree, the fungus grows, stopping this tree's ability to transport water into the branches, thereby killing the tree. The beetle then feeds on the fungus. This can take as few as a, a couple of days to a couple of weeks, and in a couple of cases I've seen a tree hang on for a month or two. There is no answer to saving the tree. There is no way to keep the fruit edible. There is no answer to saving the tree, and there's no way to keep the fruit edible if you try to, to save the tree. That, that's a problem. That particular photo that you're looking at right there, that is a uh, lady down in Wesley Chapel area, and those are what ambrosia beetles look like when they, they're not the beetle themselves, but that is the sign that that avocado tree has ambrosia beetles in it. Each one of those little white spots is a borehole. Uh, you can know an ambrosia beetle because it, the, the borehole will either look like that, or I've even seen some where the borehole almost looks like a really thin little straw coming out, and it could be two, three, four inches. Uh, I saw that after some freeze damage on some uh, other uh, plants this year, after January. Uh, that picture of the two beautiful avocado trees uh, that I showed you in the first slide of the uh, this part of the program. There they are today. Uh, they are dead as a doornail. Ambrosia beetles got them and killed, uh, actually the one that is on your right, killed it in about four weeks. It was 50 feet tall. Uh, the one on the left, I thought, well, maybe this is one of those that is a little bit more resistant to ambrosia beetle. Uh, it lasted about another two months and then it got attacked. What you see there growing in green in the middle of that tree on the left is actually uh, a, another type of tree. Uh, these two trees uh, were uh, just out wild next to a grove. Um, well, they were planted many, many years ago, but they were not maintained by any measure. The other day I was driving near those two trees, and this is what I saw. I, you see those green leaves coming off the branch of that uh, big branch? Those are that avocado tree trying to regenerate itself. Can it be successful? Probably not. Is there anything that you can do uh, to uh, make the avocado tree um, live? Yes, you can give it antibiotics, but it will make the fruit inedible. Eventually, the laurel wilt is going to win. Figs. Figs are one of the uh, trees. That if you live in a part of Florida, a part of Pasco County, but you've got an old fig tree in your yard, you can rest assured that that probably signifies that that particular yard has had farmers in it or gardeners in it for a long time. Figs are one of those things that are kind of one of those marked items that if you've got them in your yard, it means that people have been doing uh, fruit growing there for quite a while. Growing figs in Central Florida, figs like pomegranates are Mediterranean fruit. That means they like that dry summer. Uh, the humidity, though, here in Florida uh, with figs is not as bad on the fig as it is on the uh, pomegranate. Uh, the humid growing season in Florida is associated with enhanced insect and disease pressures, and rain can often split the fruit. Frig fig trees need to go dormant but the chill hours that they need are less than 100 hours per year. Now what that means is that fig tree needs to lose all its leaves, it needs that dormancy period, but it, it practically anywhere in the state of Florida uh, that you want to grow a fig tree, you're going to get enough chill hours on it. Fig trees require uh, the same planting instruction as the other trees that we've said today. Um, they do, however, like a strong dose of nitrogen in late February, early March, about four ounces of nitrogen per, age, uh, per year of age up to about two pounds. 
Figs, like the grapes, will pro produce their fruit on this year's wood. Therefore, they need that flush of growth or that flush of nitrogen in the early spring pushes the, the branches out a little further, and those figs will grow on the nodules basically right on top of the leaf nodule where the leaf has been. Look at this picture. Those those are the fig trees in my yard. Uh, I broke the uh, leaves off of those around those two figs just to show. If you look at the green one on the top, you can see there's a little white dot. Uh, that is actually the sap coming out of the out where I broke the leaf off right before I took that shot. That purple uh, is one variety of fig. It's called a um, uh, Parson Brown, I'm not a Parson Brown, but a Turkish Brown. There are a number of other varieties. There are also figs that can have opened or closed eyes. If you've ever looked at a dried fig, at the bottom of it, you see there can be a little hole in there. There are some varieties of figs that were produced by LSU, uh, called, oddly enough, LSU Gold and LSU Purple. Um, gee, wonder why those colors were mentioned, but that's another story too. But anyway, those two varieties of fig, the eye closes up and never opens, I should say. Doesn't close up, never opens. Thereby, insects have a much more difficult time getting into it. That particular parson, or that particular uh, Turkish brown right there, uh, that brown fig will get a little bit of uh, bugs walking in and out of it. And uh, that's actually, there's a wasp in the Mediterranean that pollinates the, the tree or the fruit like that. But um, the fig actually, um, probably in Florida, if I could find them, I would like to try the LSUs uh, simply because of that hole being closed up. The last fruit I'm going to talk to you about today is citrus. Uh, that particular tree is a citrus tree growing in Pasco County right now, and it looks pretty good, doesn't it? Citrus in Florida. I, I start off citrus with this. There is no fonder memory that I have as a kid growing up in Pasco County than uh, growing up than to eat a tangerine on a really cold winter day. A friend and I used to play basketball all the time uh, on winter days, and his father had a tangerine tree right next to the basketball court. We'd play a game of 21 or a game of horse. Uh, then after that, we'd climb a tree, eat a couple of uh, tangerines, go back and play another game of horse or 21. There's, I just uh, I think of that every time I think of citrus. Um, that memory, that is a memory that uh, more than likely my grandkids will never have, um, simply because I think if and when they ever saw the citrus problem in Florida, my grandkids will be older. Citrus for all extents cannot be grown for profit in Florida today, nor can it be grown in the backyard fruit for more a backyard for more than about six to eight years, what has happened? The correct term is Hung Long Bing. It is Chinese for green dragon. It is a uh, bacterial infection that was introduced into the state of Florida in the 1990s. The bacteria was brought into this country in the stomach of a very small bug called an Asian citrus psyllid. The psyllid infects the trees as it's feeding on the juices and the leaves. Uh, like most insects, it sticks its mouth parts into the leaves. It regurgitates into that leaf, there, leaf thereby causing the uh, juices around there to kind of flow a little more freely, much like a mosquito biting you, actually, and then it sucks sucks all the uh, nutrients that it's uh, in those juices back into its stomach and it's feeding. Unfortunately, as it regurgitates into that leaf, it gives that tree a bacterial infection called greening or hung bung ling or HLB. Uh, death comes uh, because the tree's vascular, uh, I'm sorry, death to the tree is generally a four to seven year process and death comes because the, vas the tree's vascular system is being destroyed by the bacteria. There is a picture of the Asian citrus psyllid, and I guarantee you that particular little bug is probably 
not much bigger than the tip of a big ballpoint pen. It, it's mighty uh, small considering all the damage that it's done. Uh, it was most of the things that you we have as problems in the state of Florida are man-made. They were brought in by Florida the, going back to the avocado and the uh, ambrosia beetle that was brought into the state of Florida uh, through a shipping container. The Asian citrus psyllid, however, uh, naturally wound its way up here, island hopping literally with Caribbean coming up. There's a picture, that was the last good year in my yard, but that's a good picture of some of the early signs of greening. That's a tangerine tree I had in my yard. If you look at the fruit in the bottom right-hand corner, I'm sorry, bottom left-hand corner, you're going to notice that the very bottom of that piece of fruit looks green, i.e. the name greening. That bottom of the fruit where the bloom had been is the oldest part of that fruit, and it should be one of the areas that ripens first, where you can see on several of those uh, tangerines, that bottom area is still green. One good way to uh, initially identify greening is that bottom of the fruit doesn't ripen. A second way to just a, to establish if it's green is misshaped fruit. In that particular picture, my thumb is on the bloom end of the citrus, and my finger is on the stem of that piece, that particular orange. And you can see that one side of it is quite small, and one side of it is quite big. Uh, that is a sign of greening. If I were to cut that piece of fruit open, I wish I had done that when I had took that picture, you would also see that the seeds inside that piece of citrus are quite small. That um, is the third real good way of, the, of, of identifying citrus greening. Small seeds, misshaped form, misshaped fruit, bottom of the fruit is green. The fourth good identifier of green is what we call early fruit drop. That tangerine tree that you're looking at right there, that picture was taken uh, in early November, right before that fruit tree should have been picked. In September, that tree was loaded with fruit. By November, that's what the farmer had underneath his tree. Literally every piece of fruit dropped off of that particular tree. That particular farmer, good friend of mine, lost probably 70% of his crop that year because of that early drop. University of Florida has no cure for that early drop, nor do they have a cure for the greening, but we'll talk about that in a second. Greening. As for the prep of... As of the prep of this presentation, there is no cure for greening. Researchers have found some varieties of citrus that show some resistance to the infection. Researchers have also found some GMO rootstocks that show some resistance. Nothing, though, that has been discovered so far will bring citrus back to pre-greening days. And these are approximations. Don't hold me to these numbers. but. In 2004, the state of Florida produced about 280 million 90-pound boxes of citrus. 280 million 90-pound boxes of citrus. This year, they produced approximately 75 million 90-pound boxes of citrus. You can quickly do the math, folks. That, that's about a 70 to 80 percent drop in production. Is there any hope for citrus in the state of Florida? That picture that you're looking at, that orange tree that is in the middle there, looks just like orange trees used to look when I was a kid growing up. Full green, can't see through the uh, uh, tree in any way, shape, or form. And as you look around that picture a little bit, you'll see every other orange tree around that is completely dead. That tree is here in Pasco County. Uh, do I think that that tree is the answer? I don't know, not necessarily. I think it will eventually succumb to the greening, but do I think there's any hope?
I do think there's some hope. I think the the tree in the last slide is a navel growing in Pasco County, like I said. Does it have the greening? Yeah, it probably does. Is it showing some resistance to it? Uh, I think it is. I do believe that there will be an answer found. The only question is when will there be an answer found? Well, that's my presentation, folks. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, my name is Steve Cox. I'm a master gardener. And if you've got any questions, concerns, or want to talk to me about any of the things I've said today, my email address is cefalo, C-E-F-A-L-O-C-O-X, the number one, at embarkmail.com. I'll be glad to talk to you. And if you want any other information, I, if I'm, as I like to say, if I'm in the state of Florida, I am generally here Fridays at the Extension Office from about uh, 9, 30, 10 to about 2. Hope you enjoyed the presentation, and good luck with your new Master Gardening course. Thanks. Bye.